X-Men 97 Season 1 finale aired on Wednesday, and apart from resolving the fallout of what happened to Wolverine, Jean, and Magneto in the penultimate episode, it also found the time to include plenty of easter eggs, cameos, and several huge teases for where the already confirmed Season 2 will be heading. So let's dive into it, shall we? With major spoilers to come, I'm Ewan, you're watching More Culture, and with me today to unpack and digest the hearty dish that was the X-Men 97 finale is one Adam Strawn. How are you doing, Adam? You and I am so good, thank you. And I am, in many ways, I'm so pleased that this is all happening, like season one's all coming together. But at the same time, I'm like, oh man, like I'm missing it. Like this show has been everything. You know, like we were talking a little bit earlier saying it's been a huge surprise as just how incredible it's really landed. You know what? It's recreated that feeling of like being a kid, getting up on Saturday morning, switching on the TV to watch like X-Men. It's just brought all of that back because I'm old enough to be one of those kids. But this has been a joy to watch, right? Like there's so many strengths in this show and like, you know, obviously we'll talk about a lot of them, but I think one of the biggest things for me is how it's been so unapologetically just X-Men following that original series, diving into all the comic book source material. And like, it doesn't feel the need to exposition dump for like new fans or anything like that. It's just going, look, this is us. We're going straight in. It tightens up a lot of the stuff that didn't work in the OG series as well. It just makes it a lot more streamlined and explores a lot of more major themes in a beautiful way. Oh man, this show has just been top tier. And honestly, one of the best things to come from the MCU in probably like the last five or six years. Yeah, from Marvel Studios, yeah, totally agree. Mm. This thing is probably been the biggest surprise of the year for me so far. Like, I obviously am a big X-Men person. I love the comics. I'm a fan of the 90s show, but mm. I don't love it as much as everyone else does. Obviously, the intro is amazing, but X-Men Evolution was kind of like my X-Men show growing up, and Goth Rogue kind of has my heart, so I'm always <laughs> going back for that one. But even so, I've absolutely adored this. I jumped on it after seeing, like, um, kind of promotional material for Nightcrawler, who's, like, my favorite X-Man. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I did not regret jumping into it one bit. It's been a total blast to sit through. I think episode five, from that point on as well, it just hits in a whole other level of, oh, we're actually doing this? Which <laughs> is something that the finale also perfectly embodies, because you'll remember that in the previous week's episode... The show went all fatal attractions on us by actually <laughs> replicating elements from that arc and having Magneto rip the adamantium from Wolverine's skeleton, which um, they're just, between this and Genosha, they're just repeating all the most traumatic X-Men moments of my childhood. So thanks, thanks show, I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we pick up immediately after that in this finale, um, kind of Wolverine is... <laughs> He's out of commission. Mm -hmm. He's not having a good time. Jean returns during her fight with Cable and assumes the role of the Phoenix again with the iconic noise and obviously the music from the 90s show too. Um, Charles goes into Magneto's mind and forces him to, you know, reverse the magnetic damage that he'd done to the Earth. Uh, Rogue takes on Bastion in a really cool kind of revenge for Gambit moment. Yes. And then we have nukes come in. We have loads of stuff coming, like going on in this episode that it's kind of hard to process, but at the same time, it's all really digestible and of course leaves us on two big cliffhangers or three depending with obviously it taking place six months after the events of the the kind of like bastion's attack and asteroid m suddenly disappearing with the x-men and now we've got forge and bishop with a new mission to find out not where they went <laughs> but when mm. Yeah, this. So, oh, yeah. It's it's. There's, there's a lot of stuff coming up in the second season. Yeah, massively. I mean, obviously, you got like the little after credit sting as well, like the confirmation of like apocalypse coming and everything like that as well. But man, so much to digest, and I love like this. I think this last episode as well really leaned hard into all of the cameos, right? Like we had like Peter Parker, Mary Jane. We had like I've got a complete list of them here. Oh my so, god, let's go. The first so. This has been one of the most pleasant aspects of the show. As someone, again, speaking as someone who's kind of like fed up with a kind of like a recognized things culture that Marvel developed over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. I still absolutely popped massively for each and every one of these. So the first thing we get is more for assuming yet another identity of an iconic Marvel hero. This time yep. um, they take on kind of Mr. Fantastic's like uh, body to, to, to hang on as there's like a vacuum in space going on. We get a returning appearance from Captain America joined this time by the iconic version of the 90s Iron Man. 
Daredevil, who is like yes. one of my favorite heroes of all time, gets a great little unexpected ass kicking cameo. <laughs> Doctor Strange is doing surgery, Black Panther shows up, albeit as T'Chaka, which is a little bit confusing given that it should be T'Challa really there. Uh, Cloak and Dagger have a moment, Alpha Flight show up, Omega Red shows up, Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, and Polaris also appear in Magneto's Fractured Psyche. And then of course we have the Peter Parker, Mary Jane, and Flash Thompson moment, which Adam, I actually have a question for you here mm. because you will have watched the 90s Spider-Man show yeah. as well. Does this not, is this the appearance of Mary Jane here not like resurrect all sorts of weird questions? Like, wasn't she a Hydro Man clone? And <laughs> why have you given me that trauma again to sit through? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it brings up a lot of that. But to be honest, you know, it was just a pleasure to see them again. Like that classic iconic look of Mary Jane, like with that red hair and then standing next to that particular Peter Parker as well was just, it won me over. Honestly, it took my heart. And like, that's what I love about this, where it's not just like, you know, it's cameos in the sense of like the old animated versions of these characters that we know, as you said, you mentioned like the 90s Iron Man as well. And that was such a pleasure to see that version of him as well. And one of the big things that I love, love about all of this is that, you know, in the MCU prior to this, we've had such this big build up of the Avengers being like the team, the ones to save the world, to take everything down. And obviously that, you know, in many ways worked in great ways, but X-Men is really just pushing forward of, hang on a second, like, this is the team to save the day. Like, these are the guys, the ones. And, like, you know, you, you heard mentions of, like, the Avengers and everything through this series, but, like, what were they doing? Apart from being in boardrooms, <laughs> chilling out. Whereas we had the X-Men literally going up and leaving the, like, the actual world to go and save the day. And, man, yeah, like, think just... Incredible. There's some explanation for the Avengers being away. I forget yeah. where it comes up, but I think maybe we might see further integration of the different Marvel shows in the second season. You've got to think that someone at Marvel oh, has yeah. seen the success of this and is thinking, okay, maybe we should do Spider-Man next. Mm -hmm. Not that we sh I would love to see new animated shows at the same time, obviously, but there is a reason why these resonated so well when they first came out and continue to resonate. So fingers crossed that maybe some of these teasers actually leads to something more substantial in the second season, which we're going to get to now, because as I said earlier, there were three kind of big cliffhanger moments here. Obviously, we mentioned the one involving Forge and Bishop kind of hunting for when the X-Men went to, uh, because obviously we know at this point that the X-Men have been blasted in two different directions mm. in time. So we have, on one hand, uh, Cyclops and Jean in the future in a post-apocalyptic year of 3,960, while Mag Magneto, Rogue, Nightcrawler, and Beast are back in 3,000 BC, where they meet En Sabanur, who is, of course, Apocalypse. Now, some important context for you here. So the Cyclops and Jean... Um, they meet a clan called the Ascani, mm. who are actually also looking after a young Nathan Summers, which obviously recontextualizes the relationship between them from the show going up into that point. Um, and it's also taking from a specific arc in the comics, so it's a limited series in the 90s called The Adventures of Cyclops and Jean Grey, which kind of saw the duo getting up to adventures in the future and raising Cable. Um, and I'm not going to go too heavily into spoilers in that comic because I want to leave surprises for people yeah. who are watching the show but all i'm gonna say is that the identity of the ascani leader that they meet is a big deal so mm. just keep an eye on her as you're getting ready for the next season um and i'm kind of yeah i'm i'm looking forward to that dynamic because the relationship between cyclops and gene for me has been the unexpected highlight of this show, I kind of went into it thinking we're going to get lots of Wolverine. But Wolverine's yeah. really been a bit player throughout this. The primary focus really has been on Magneto and then Jean and Cyclops. So are you looking forward to seeing them in this future setting, getting to actually, you know have a chance to raise their child, albeit in a slightly, you know, dystopian vibe. No, 100%. I'm so pleased you've said that, Ewan, because as we said, like, earlier, like, the big theme of a lot of, like, the X-Men movies basically has been Wolverine. I think that's the star power of Hugh Jackman, right? Like, suddenly it made him this huge star, so the focus was really pushed on him, for better or worse, in those, obviously, Fox movies there. But with this, like, I think one of the best things about the characterization of Scott in particular is just how much more fleshed out he's been, right? We've seen him as a father, we've seen him as a leader. Like in episode one to hear him say to me, my X-Men was just like shivers. It was incredible. And like, you know, like give him the weather forecast and like all of this, just these epic, like cheesy, but epic lines coming from him. But yeah, to see like this different side of him, how conflicted he is, like obviously with Madeline Pryor, with Jean and like what happened there. And then obviously he's got this child now and 
fatherhood dancing around spoilers here but fatherhood will also be explored in other ways as well in that um as we go into season two probably with the way things end but man like just to go from that characterization that we saw like in live action you know we were saying like his nickname slim and we got like a lot of that basically in the movies whereas this we are seeing it's so far removed from that now we're seeing a much stronger much more well-written explored scott and a lot of the characters in that respect, but especially him, I think they've really worked on making him this really engaging and really just incredible leader and father figure. Honestly, Scott nails it. <laughs> yeah, no, totally highlight of the show for me as well. And obviously we have the other X-Men team who are in the past, and this looks to be taking more inspiration from the Rise of Apocalypse comics, mm. which came out in the 90s. Um, fun fact, the original X-Men animated show actually inspired the iconic Age of Apocalypse comics as hey. well with a particular episode. Uh, and it very much feels like season two is going to revolve around Apocalypse, who kind of looms large in these final frames because not only do we get that t that ending tease of the, the guys being in, in ancient Egypt and seeing the young Apocalypse, we mm. get this post-credit bit where Apocalypse is in Genosha and he kneels down at the site of where Gambit died, mourning the loss of all his mutant brethren and he says, so much pain, so much death as he picks up Gambit's playing card now obviously the x-men never die baby that's the whole thing you know the <laughs> x-men just don't die they have a real habit of just coming back and yeah gambit will be coming back in season two that i can guarantee and it looks as though if they couldn't have been more on the nose with it that he'll be coming back as a horseman of apocalypse mm. specifically death which is what happened in the early 2000s during Peter Milligan's run on X-Men. He ended up joining Apocalypse there after a little bit of tomfoolery from Mystique trying to push him and Rogue away from each other. Um, so that's exciting. And the other thing that I want to bring up here in regards to Gambit becoming a Horseman of Apocalypse is that I would also bank on Wolverine becoming a, uh, another Horseman of Apocalypse as well because that, in the comics, is how he got his adamantium back. Apocalypse brainwashed him and made him war and took the adamantium from Sabretooth and was like, here you go, Logan, have that back. <laughs> so, yeah, bringing up for a really apocalyptic second season, which I'm very much excited about because Apocalypse has always kind of been like the ultimate X-Men bad guy. Like Magneto has been a villain historically, but as we've seen in this show, he's kind of cooler as an anti-hero. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking forward to see the Apocalypse get his uh, his spot in the sun. Oh my God, but yes. But I mean, let's just go back for a second and talk about Gambit, baby. Like Gambit has been my boy of this season. Like the Genosha, you know, episode there, remember it? My God, you and I am still not over it. Wow. <laughs> like and Gambit was has gone through such an arc as well and like really like the limited time compared to everybody else that he was in the show you know like everything with Rogue and then it, with Rogue and Magneto and like having to be a bystander of that and then Rogue figuring out her feelings but then it's too late because he makes the ultimate sacrifice and my god just Gambit saying remember it and then just everything happening there like that I am still not over Genosha being destroyed like that broke my heart like the moment with like Magneto and Leech, like my God, like I am not over this, but I am so pleased that we're going to get obviously Gambit coming back in this form because I think it will bring a really interesting dynamic of what happens going into season two. You know, when he sees Rogue again, what will that look like and everything there? I'm just, oh, I'm so excited for this, but I'm just so pleased we're bringing back obviously Gambit in this form. But as you said, you know, this is X-Men. We get resurrections all the time. Obviously, when we finally move in into Krakoa as well, we'll see this all again. But I'm really pleased that the show didn't end with that. It's still like hanging on to the stakes of what made everything drastic this season. But then we're going in a really interesting different direction there we didn't just kind of reset everything with a you know resurrection protocol but i'm super excited to see what they're going to do with that yeah so we currently don't have a release date on season two which is very annoying because <laughs> i ended up not expecting to like watch this show and then i have and now i'm completely hooked um but i think judging from how kind of we've had previous gaps before in marvel animated stuff i think what if tends to take a gap of about two years in between seasons so we could be looking at the end of 2025 or some point in time in 2026 for season two of X-Men 97 a drop. But I want to know what all of you thought of the finale down in the comments below. Are you, like Adam, still emotionally traumatized <laughs> by the events of Genosha? Which arc are you looking forward to the most that's coming up here? Are you looking forward most to seeing them back in ancient Egypt and chilling with the, the young and Sabineur? Or are you looking forward to seeing Cyclops and Jean kind of doing future adventures together? I really would like to know. So let us know down there. Give the video a like if you enjoyed 
enjoyed it and subscribe to What Culture if you haven't already for more fun, uncanny content like this every single day. But for now, I have been Ewan. And I've been Adam. And we will catch you next time.